Hi, my name is Tristan Snowsill. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Exeter, and I'm glad to be speaking to you about propagation of uncertainty through economic models using Taylor series approximations, which I call the Delta PSA method. I'm on Twitter if you'd like to follow me at TM Snowsill. Just a bit of background, talking here about decision analytic models. So these will take um, a set of inputs, which we might call parameters, put them in through some form of mathematical model and produce some outputs of interest, which most critically will be things like incremental costs and incremental benefits. One of the advantages of decision analytic modeling is it lets us see what the impact of uncertainty in those inputs means in terms of uncertainty in outputs. And the gold standard for doing this is typically a Monte Carlo probabilistic sensitivity analysis. So rather than assuming that those inputs are fixed and known, we instead treat them as coming from a joint probability distribution. We repeatedly sample from that joint distribution and then for each of those samples, we run the model and we obtain the corresponding results. And then analyzing those results can help us to understand what decision uncertainty we have. <clears throat> So here's the typical kind of output you'd get from a Monte Carlo PSA. Each one of those points is one iteration, so one set of parameters that's been sampled and the resulting incremental qualities and costs from that. Often it's more helpful to look at the probability of cost effectiveness for one treatment against the willingness to pay for a unit of benefit, such as an additional quality. So that's the cost effectiveness acceptability curve. We might also want to know what the expected value of perfect information is. So how much value could we get by reducing the uncertainty to nil to help our decision making? There are some disadvantages though of Monte Carlo PSA. It can be time consuming, especially if it needs to be done repeatedly, for example, in value of information analyses, subgroup analyses or sensitivity analyses. It's also non-deterministic, so generally you won't get the same results each time you run it. The Delta PSA is an alternative to the Monte Carlo PSA. We treat the decision analytic model as a vector function of many variables. So we've got G superscript 1 up to G superscript M, so M different possible outputs from the model, um, and then the various inputs to the model are thetas 1 to M. We assume that those inputs follow a multivariate normal distribution that has a mean of mu theta and a variance covariance matrix of sigma theta. It might be necessary for us to transform some of these so that that multivariate normal assumption is reasonable, for example, with log or logit transformations. Then the first order Taylor series of that vector function around a given point is determined by um, the grad of that function, which is the partial derivative of its various components against the different uh, parameters. That's also known as the Jacobian matrix. And so when we have uh, these theta being random variables, uh, we can use this to estimate the variance of the function. And this is called the delta method. It's used quite often in statistics, and that's why this method is called the delta PSA method. Um, so the variance of your outputs from your model is determined by the variance of your inputs, that sigma theta, with the Jacobian matrix on either side. If you're looking to get the expected value uh, and you use the first order Taylor series approximation, it doesn't give you a suitable formula. It just says your expected value of your outcome is the same as um, applying your model with the expected value for the parameters. And we know that's not the case because of model nonlinearities. So we need to extend to a second order Taylor series approximation. <clears throat> now, in this case, we're looking one component at a time. So G superscript K would be one of the outputs from the model. And the thing that we're adding this time round is the Hessian matrix. So this H superscript K. So that's the second partial derivative of that particular component of the function with respect to the parameters. 
So the Delta PSA needs you to have a deterministic model, which is a, a function of the many variables that go in and for those model inputs to be approximately multivariate normal. And then what it produces are expected values and the variance covariance matrix of the outputs from the model. Now you probably don't think of typical models as being a function. We would normally have something more like a Markov cohort simulation and the Delta PSA method works fine. Um, so let's have a look here at a Markov model that has K states. The cohort membership at a given time T is given by X subscript T. And the transition matrix for that cycle or time T is given by P subscript T. And then the uh, Markov model evolves as you would expect. X at time T plus one is that transition probability matrix multiplying the state membership vector. If we just assume for now that we only have one outcome of interest, so just G, um, and that is calculated by applying a value vector V sub T to the state vector in each of the cycles, um, <clears throat> that value vector can account for things like discounting, different quality weights in different states and half cycle corrections. Now we can use the product rule for differentiation to derive relations, recurrence relations for that Jacobian and the Hessian matrix all the way through to the G that comes out at the end of the model. So um, del uh, partial G by partial beta I is just the sum of that G at each of the time cycles. Then within each cycle that G sub T is given by the partial derivative of V multiplying um, the state vector X plus the value vector V times the partial uh, differential of the state vector X. So that's just the product rule um, when it's in uh, matrix or vector form. And the same thing happens with the Markov recurrence relation. We can take the partial derivative of that equation on both sides. And we can take those partial derivatives again to get the second differentials and get those Hessian matrices that we wanted. So uh, I've applied this in an example. It's an example from the Briggs et al. handbook, Decision Modeling for Health Economic Evaluation. And it's a Markov cohort simulation of prostheses for total hip replacement. So we've got a standard prosthesis and a new prosthesis, which is called NP1. <coughs> This model has four states, uh, so a successful primary hip replacement, uh, or when somebody needs a revision operation, that's the revision THR, and then there's a successful revision state following a successful revision. Those um, operations can have mo uh, operative mortality, however, and also people can die from other causes. So here's the transition probability matrix up in the top right and you will notice that rather than being a four by four transition probability matrix it's actually an eight by eight and that's because we've taken the markov models for the two cohorts so the standard and the np1 cohorts and we've combined them into one markov model but there's no way for those cohorts to interact um, so that top left block uh, is the standard prosthesis and in here you'll see that there's a risk of dying in each cycle QT. Um, if you're having a revision operation there's an additional risk of dying which is Psi so that's the um, operative mortality rate. We also have this row parameter that's the risk of re-revision being needed and then the thing that differs between the two arms other than cost is this risk of needing your primary hip replacement to be revised. So there's R subscript T standard, R subscript T NP1. And in that Markov cohort simulation, these are given by Weibull model. So in total, we have 12 parameters which are subject to uncertainty in this model. The first five of them are parameters for that Weibull uh, survival model. And then we have three which relate, uh, sorry, two which relate to operative mortality risk. 
uh, one applies right at the beginning of the model, so it didn't show up in that um, transition matrix. Then we also have the risk of re-revision. <clears throat> then we have three uh, health state utility values down here. We have a cost for being in that revision state. You'll notice that we've taken some logit transformations for parameters which originally followed a beta distribution, but they now follow a logit normal distribution. Also, this cost uh, followed a gamma distribution in the original model, but it now follows a log normal distribution. So that's just so that you can see the formula for the risk of revision. These normal approximations are fairly good. So that's the, the original beta distribution is in red, um, whereas the logit normal approximation is in blue or sort of bluey green. Uh, for the cost parameter where we have the gamma and the log normal, that's quite a good fit there as well. And so our, <clears throat> our parameter vector, which has 12 parameters, here are the expected values for those just for reference. And here's the variance covariance matrix. So you'll see the first five parameters, we have a full um, covariance structure, which came from the survival analysis. The other parameters are assumed to be uh, independent of each other, which is why you have zeros in the off diagonals for them. We've gone from having a value vector, which I talked about previously, to now having value matrices. So that's because we've got six outcomes now instead of one. So those six outcomes are the costs and qualities in the standard prosthesis, costs and qualities in the new prosthesis, and then incremental costs and incremental qualities. And then we have eight states in the model. So our value matrix at each time point is an eight by six matrix. And <clears throat> the only Thing that varies over time is actually this discounting that's factored in to these value matrices. Okay. I didn't solve all of the um, differentials myself. I did get some help from R, which I would recommend people do. Quite easy to get set up. And so here's the R implementation. These are the various arrays that get um, processed as you go through the method. And here's the output from that example. So uh, across the top, we have costs. Across the bottom, it's qualities. The first column is the standard prosthesis, absolute outcomes. Middle column is the NP1 prosthesis, absolute outcomes. And then the right-hand column is the incremental costs and the incremental qualities. And in the black line is the uh, Monte Carlo PSA with 20,000 iterations, whereas the blue dashed line is the outcome from the Delta PSA. So you'll see that it is quite a good approximation other than there's a bit of skewness in the Monte Carlo PSA that doesn't get picked up by this method. <clears throat> You can translate that uh, into a cost effectiveness acceptability curve. So now we have the delta PSA is the solid red line. Monte Carlo PSA is now the dashed blue line. So you see they match quite closely. Likewise, we have the expected value of perfect information curves with the Monte Carlo PSA in the blue dashed line and the delta PSA with the red line. So working quite well for value of information analysis as well. <clears throat> the Delta PSA method was very efficient. It only took 1.4 seconds to run um, versus over a minute to do the Monte Carlo PSA with 20,000 iterations. Obviously, you can reduce the number of iterations and it will run faster. Also could have spent some time, you know, using parallelized computing or something, but as an indication, it's very efficient. And so in conclusion, uh, the Delta PSA is a very efficient method for probabilistic sensitivity analysis that is a viable alternative to Monte Carlo probabilistic sensitivity analysis. It gives a deterministic approximation to the outcomes, and there is also an R implementation which you can check out online. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to any questions that you may have.